Hello there. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday edition of Your Business Nigeria. Here are the stories we are following up at this time. The Debt Management Office has revealed that Nigeria's debt has pushed the country's total public debt stock from 41.6 trillion naira as of March 2022 to 42.84 trillion naira as of June this year, showing an increase of 1.24 trillion naira in three months. This was contained in the press release published on the DMO's website. According to DMO, the federal government was unable to secure any foreign loans in the second quarter of 2022. The office also notes that external debt remained the same at 16.6 trillion naira uh, from Q1 to Q2 2022. According to the body, 58% of external debt was concessional and semi-concessional loans from multilateral lenders, such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, Afriexim Bank, Africa Development Bank, and bilateral lenders including Germany, China, Japan, India, and France. Domestic debt rose 26.23 trillion naira, which is about $63.24 billion due to government borrowings uh, to finance the deficit in 2022 Appropriation Act, as well as new borrowings by state governments and the FCT. Chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service, Mr. Mohamed Nami, has disclosed that the mandate of the services is to collect taxes uh, that are due to the country and not to grant tax waivers to any taxpayer in the country. Mr. Nami stated this in a swift reaction to news making the rounds as some companies have been granted tax waivers on pioneer status between 2019 and 2020 in the sum of 16 trillion naira by the FRS and other federal government agencies. He, however, noted that the services is not unmindful of the objectives of granting tax waivers to investors which he said includes helping to grow local companies, stimulate economic growth, and earn investors' confidence. He also stated that he is confident that the companies which are now enjoying tax breaks will eventually exit shortly and begin to pay taxes to the federal government, as is currently being done by companies that have equally enjoyed such tax breaks in the past and are now paying taxes in hundreds of billions of naira. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and oil marketers under the ages of the petroleum retail outlet owners of Nigeria are worried of the impending fiscal crisis in the country following the continuous rise in subsidy on premium metal spirits. NESG expressed its concerns in the group's September 2022 report as figures from the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited indicated that petrol subsidy gulped 2.04 trillion naira between January and July this year. In the latest report on the state of the economy, the group observed that the federal government's huge fuel subsidy spending has been a drain on the country's revenue despite the rise in the crude oil prices. It said government should cut its fiscal deficit uh, to avert an impending fiscal crisis, highlighting the gradual withdrawal of fuel subsidy as one of the measures to achieve this. Let's get to our first topic now. Nigeria's maritime sector is one of the key sectors of its economy, or that of Nigeria's economy, as it plays strategic roles in economic growth and job creation. Despite its enormous potential, the sector is still fraught with myriads of challenges such as port congestion, bureaucratic bottlenecks, policy somersaults, infrastructure deficit, among others. These issues have not only hampered the growth of the industry, but have also undermined the country's chances of securing a seat at the International Maritime Organization, IMO. Well, joining me live as we discuss these issues, with a view of preferring possible solutions, I is the Executive Secretary and Chief Executive of the Nigerian Shippers Council, Mr. Emmanuel Jime. Uh, the Shippers, Nigerian Shippers Council, as a port economic regulator, is saddled with the responsibilities of protecting Nigerian shippers and promoting the development of inland dry ports. The Executive Secretary, Mr. Jime, is joining us live on the show. Good afternoon. It's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon, Tolu, and uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us this very important platform uh, to be able to discuss uh, some key issues in a very important industry, uh, the maritime sector. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Now let's go straight to business. Considering the peculiar nature of the industry with various stakeholders, now how have you been able to micromanage the various interests within the ambit of the council as the regulators seem to assume office, well, of course, over a year ago. Well, once again, thank you. Um, so the maritime industry is a very huge industry. 
Uh, it is huge because I believe it can be argued, and I believe correctly also, that next to oil, perhaps you know, the most important uh, industry that can impact on the economic fortunes of this Let nation. Now, you asked how have we been able to micromanage interest in the industry? I think first it is important to identify that we have a number of very serious multinational institutions that are interested in the maritime uh, sector of our economy. We are talking about shipping companies, uh, whether it is terminal operators, uh, and then of course a couple of other very important stakeholders uh, that are interested in doing business in our maritime domain. Uh, but the implication of that is that you need to have a regulatory framework that is clear enough so everybody that is doing business in our ports is well guided as to how they can go about doing the business. Uh, now that is where the Nigeria Shippers Council's responsibility as port economic regulator comes in. What we have done in the time that I've been here uh, is to get the support of the Federal Minister of Transportation to be able to institute a regulatory regime in the port sector. And I'm happy to say that today, anyone who is actually involved in the conduct of business in our ports uh, is quite aware of the regulatory regime that is in place. In order for us to be able to carry all of our stakeholders and to be, met, to be able to also macro-manage all of the interests that are involved, we have delivered a certain number of tools to be able to do this. For instance, we have instituted an quarterly sectoral meetings that we engage with all industry stakeholders. Uh, like I said, the shipping companies, terminal operators, uh, the freight forwarders, organized private sector. Uh, all of these are very important stakeholders to which we've had regular meetings at the quarterly level in order for us to be able to address the peculiar challenges. Uh, the council also maintains cordial relationships with our sister agencies, uh, especially the MPA, for example, uh, MIMASA, uh, and then other government agencies like the customs. I mean, we have very, very good working relationship. We've been able to develop a very cordial environment in which we're functioning uh, with these other agencies of government. Uh, one key area of our efforts has been to be able to ensure industrial harmony in the sector. Uh, not too long ago, the Maritime Workers Union that is working very, very closely with us. And I'd like to take this platform to appreciate the support that we have received from that particular group. Very, very important key uh, uh, stakeholder in our industry. Uh, they have wanted on a number of occasions to down tools, but because of the very good working relationship that we, have, that we have with them, they were more than willing to listen to us. And in most cases, we were able to abat disruptions in the industry. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge that. But I'm interested in making that point because harmony in the workplace, especially in our courts, is key to the manner in which we are able to deliver on this uh, economic potential. You know, so those are areas of you know, effort and work uh, that the Nigeria Shippers Council is involved with in making sure that we're able to manage successfully. And I'm happy to say that today there is sufficient enough harmony in the workplace as far as our industry is concerned. The port economic regulator. Now, let me ask uh, uh, how well you've been able to, uh, especially when in protecting shippers, what have you done and promoting inland dry ports development? That's um, very important to us. A very important question, I must say. First, let me make this point. So the Shippers Council has actually evolved away from being specifically a consumer protection agency. In other words, we are not any longer simply a protector of the interests of shippers. By the very nature of our mandate as port economic regulator, 
we now also have had an extra evolutionary mandate that demands of us uh, to be unbiased in the way in which we are regulating the industry. In other words, we now are interested in protecting both the interests of providers of services and also the interests of consumers of services. So that is the particular, peculiar role that the Shippers Council is playing at this moment. Um, we've, because we've been able to bring everybody on board uh, and to buy into the regulatory framework that we have in place, there are a number of things that we're using as tools to be able to deliver uh, efficiency and effectiveness. Because at the end of the day, that is the core mandate now of the Shepherds Council, to ensure efficiency and to also promote effectiveness uh, of port services uh, in our ports. We're also actually engaged in the business of moderating freight and ensuring that the charges that are levied in our ports can be tied and are relevant to the services that are delivered. These are the essential elements that constitute the regulatory framework and the regulatory work that we're doing in the industry. Now, to deliver on those tools, there are a number of variables that were put in place. So today, for instance, all stakeholders have been able to gain from the provision of indicative uh, freight rates, which is uh, information that is required for uh, stakeholders to be able to conduct their business in our ports. We have also been involved in setting of standards you know, of service delivery. Uh, we also are interested in the provision of guidelines uh, for tariff setting. What is actually very important in what we've done is the ability to harmonize tariff nomenclature of port service providers. Uh, we are also monitoring and enforcing compliance you know, with approved standards, of course, and tariff structure uh, in the industry. There is, of course, the very important uh, effort of standardization of haulage rates. Uh, let me mention this. We have a very effective and a robust complaints handling mechanism that is available in council that stakeholders have been able to take advantage of in order to have a resolution of crisis. Now, don't forget, as I mentioned earlier, because of the very huge nature of the industry and because of its potentials, there is also sufficient enough avenue for crisis you know, to arise. The ability of the Shippers Council to be able to get parties to come into a, into, into a room using the alternative you know, dispute resolution mechanism that we have in place through our complaints unit uh, is helping tremendously in making sure that uh, the Shippers Council is delivering on the need uh, to have an effective and efficient port system uh, in our, our port ecosystem. Last but not least, we have been in the front burner of advocating you know, for automation of port uh, processes and procedures. Uh, now, that clearly means that we are promoting digitalization. Uh, we're ensuring that all of the stakeholders in the industry imbibe the culture and the need to have all their processes automated. And then you can then imagine you know, what ultimately does, uh, that uh, brings to bear. Uh, on economic activities in the ports. Let me quickly digress in mentioning and addressing the point you asked in your question about inland dry ports and uh, some of the very critical transport infrastructure that the Shepherds Council is concerned with in delivery. So we're promoting the establishment of these uh, critical infrastructures. Uh, the inland dry ports is a very key component of the uh, critical transport infrastructure that the Shepherds Council promotes. Now, a lot of people have asked, why the inland drive ports? Why do we even need them in the first place? Now, I have argued, and I believe correctly, that any port, a seaport, is only efficient to the extent of its connectivity to the hinterlands. Now, how are you able to connect into the hinterlands? The dry ports provide an avenue for shippers to be able to conduct their businesses in the hinterland without necessarily having to go through the challenge and the difficulty of all coming to the seaport in order to conduct their business. So effectively, inland dry ports are bringing shipping, all right, closer into the, uh, closer to the, you know, to the shippers in, in, in the hinterlands. 
Uh, that's one advantage, of course, of our inland dry port. Second, we are by that measure also decongesting the seaport and making sure that the level of congestion that hitherto we had had in our port uh, is actually a thing of the past. Not that we have completely eliminated congestion, but I'm only making the point that this is uh, the inland dry ports actually are a component uh, of how we've been able to conceive uh, the decongestion of our port. Uh, at the moment, I'm happy to announce in this uh, in this conversation this morning that the dry port in Kano, for example, the Dala inland dry port, happily, not too long ago, the Minister of Transportation declared that port to be a port of origin and a port of destination. The implication of that is that that port is now ready to start running. The same can be said of the dry port in Funtua, which actually is also at a level of development that is very, very close uh, to what we have uh, at the Dala uh, dry port in Kano. Uh, let me also mention that the, before now, we had this inland container depot in Kaduna, which uh, in the wisdom of government was upgraded into an inland dry port. That is already functioning. We have a couple of other inland dry ports spread all over all the six geopolitical zones of the nation. And the understanding uh, behind why we need it, you know, to establish these dry ports is what I explained earlier. We need to bring shipping closer. And of course, we also be able to decongest, I mean, uh, decongest our ports. So that in, a sum, in summary represents uh, part of the activities that we are engaged in. Uh, as I mentioned, we're happy to say that today the Dala report is at the point where business is most likely going to commence in the shortest amount of time. Uh, finally, I also would like to zero in on uh, the just inland report, which uh, uh, Clatter State Government is uh, in its. Uh, in its uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so I was just going to zero in on inland dry port in Jor, which is one of the dry port. As far as the level of development on that uh, uh, project uh, is, is, uh, is concerned. So these are the activities uh, of the Shippers Council, and I, I, I'm happy to have the opportunity you know, to speak. Uh, to uh, some of the monumental achievements that I believe uh, have been recorded uh, in, 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 in the short amount of time that I've been here. Uh, one day. Well, let's talk about this that really interests me because I am one of those believers that Africa needs to trade amongst each other. And it takes me to the AFCFTA. Uh, how well are SHIP has been able, of course, to perform uh, regards to the FCFT and, of course, echo as trade amongst uh, each other. Now, so the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme, otherwise called the ETLS, all right, is a trade instrument that was aimed at encouraging right, duty-free trade among ECOWAS member states. Uh, the objective of the ETLS is to liberalize trade by abolishing you know, customs duties, leaving on imports and exports, and also to eliminate non-tariff barriers among member states for the establishment of free trade area at the community level. Under the ETLS scheme, Nigeria's target has been to secure greater regional market access, uh, thus promoting industrialization through export, uh, export-led growth, and of course, capacity building, which is required in order to meet global you know, market competition. Now, currently, uh, a substantial number of Nigerian businesses actually are already uh, involved in business in this community. Uh, need I mention that this is a community whose population is close to 350 million. Now, you can best imagine if Nigerian traders uh, yes. ETLS and are able you know, to do business 
that will extend to three hundred million if it was community. That's advantage of the ETLS. But I want to quickly point out some of the challenges that I believe have mitigated against the ability of Nigerians to be able to take full advantage of this particular platform. So for instance, you have these cumbersome custom processes, as well as high custom tariffs within you know, the Nigerian side of the border. Uh, that is an impediment, a very, very serious impediment that is actually impact, impacting on the ability of Nigerians to take advantage of this particular scheme. There's also very complex and expensive procedures for obtaining okay, rules of origin certificate. I mean, that is also a mitigating factor in our ability to be able to take full advantage. Now, let me quickly address multiple roadblocks and checkpoints, especially along my two uh, to semi axis. I mean, we've been discussing this for far too long a time, and I believe the time has come for us to really take a second look at ourselves. Now, Tolu, you won't believe it. If you were to go from Seme to Ghana, the, uh, the, the number of checkpoints that you have from Seme to Ghana, that's you're talking between Benin and Ghana, you are not likely to have more than four checkpoints on that corridor. But between Seme and my two, the number of checkpoints are I am not sure we can even count them. True. I'm not sure we can even count them. So this clearly is a constraint on our ability of Nigerian traders to take advantage of this very wonderful scheme that's available uh, to Nigerian traders. So, of course, we have some other issues. There's language barrier, which is a problem. Uh, uh, people take advantage of that to also extort. Uh, we also have this uh, lack of clear understanding uh, of the provisions of the um, ETLS that I've just mentioned. Uh, these are a couple of challenges that you know Nigerian traders are facing. Now, I can speak to what the Shippers Council is trying to do in order for us to be able to bridge and to address some of these challenges, at least within our own capacity. So, for instance, we have taken uh, decisive steps to ensure that Nigerian trade actually benefits from this, uh, uh, the, the, this scheme. One of the things we have done is to be able to establish what we call border information centers. Uh, we have a couple of them. One in, uh, is in, uh, at Seme. Uh, we have the other one, uh, two of them now actually, at Jibia and Ilela. Uh, these are border towns, if you if you permit my saying. So now the border information centers are an initiative of the Nigeria Shippers Council to be able to provide sufficient enough knowledge of the workings of the ETLS and the wordings so that Nigerian traders can fully take benefit and take advantage of the information that's available to them in order for them to be able to conduct their businesses across our border. So that uh, is part of you know, the effort uh, of, of the Nigerian Shippers Council in order uh, for us to take uh, full advantage. Um, after uh, that's African uh, Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement, again, is not too different from the ETLS scheme. This is perhaps uh, a much more expanded uh, platform in order for Nigerian traders to be able to trade across the whole of the African continent. That really is the slight difference you may ask. Uh, Nigeria should actually have had the benefit of having fully implemented the ETLS, because if I'd done that, moving to after would just have been seamless. It would have been a very, very simple transition because it would then mean that all the lessons that were would have learned from the implementation of the ETLS would be brought to bear on our operations at AFTA. Uh, but like I said, those challenges that we have at the moment, unless and until we're able to over, overcome those challenges, there is no way are we going to fully take the benefit of all of these schemes, whether it is the ETLS or after. 
these all these are all platforms that are actually in place. So Nigerian traders can actually have the full benefit of accessing the whole of the African continent. And you can best imagine the multiplier effect uh, the, of the economic benefits that can come as a result of uh, Nigeria's participation in all of this. Now, a couple of other challenges that I will, I will broadly categorize in two. So for instance, we have uh, what are called trade infrastructure challenges. And under this, let me address rehabilitation of critical road networks uh, that will facilitate local and international trade. We also have to develop and complete rail projects that will facilitate cargo movement around uh, Africa and all over the continent. Uh, on that trade uh, infrastructure, uh, also we are advocate, advocating for uh, installation of adequate warehousing and uh, quorum facilities for perishable cargoes uh, at major air and seaports. Uh, of course, we're also advocating that there should be a completion of critical efficiency enhancement projects, right, such as access roads, vehicle transit parks, uh, consolidation centers, you know, installation of scanners. I mean, again, installation of scanners. I mean, we'll discuss this for the length of time that I can remember. Uh, I still cannot understand for the life of, my, uh, of me why is it difficult to simply install scanners in our ports so that we can stop all this manual inspection of the uh, of cargo and all the attendant consequences of delay uh, that ultimately is leading you know to a challenge in our ability to seamlessly conduct business in our ports now on that trade environment that is another categorization of the challenges that we have i said we have trade infrastructure there's also trade environment uh, and i believe there is need for government uh, to intervene in the implementation of favorable exchange rates by the CBN so as to promote export-oriented uh, economic growth. Uh, I also think that it is important government should conclude very soon, very soon enough, critical trade facilitation initiatives, such as the implementation of the national single window. Again, a recurring word that we use is becoming like a cliche. Uh, then, of course, the sustained implementation of Nigeria's ease of doing business action plans. These are a number of the factors and variables that I believe need to be put on the table so that uh, uh, we're able to achieve uh, the desired goal of yeah. making uh, Nigeria a true hub as far as business, particularly in our sub-region, is concerned. Mm. I see uh, CEO, Executive Secretary, Nigerian Shippers Council is really loaded. Uh, we must have uh, another conversation around this because this is what time can take uh, for today. I must thank you for making real sense of issues surrounding the maritime industry and what you're doing uh, to actually make things better uh, than you met it. Mr. Emmanuel Jime, thank you so much for your time. We'll surely have uh, another uh, day to talk more about some aspects we weren't able to touch today on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tulu. And let's do this again, quickly enough. All right, then. <laughs> Thank you for staying tuned. Now, after gaining independence in 1960, Nigeria has been resolute in building strong bilateral relations with the international community in the bid to strengthen economic ties and boost foreign direct investment. Going by the growing diplomatic relations with the United States, Nigeria has been described as the second largest U.S. export destination in sub-Saharan Africa with an export trade investment worth $10 billion as of 2019. We will also interest you to know that the trade value between, a volume between Nigeria and the United Kingdom is valued at about £3.2 billion as um, of uh, 2021, a development that has made the Nigerian government more resilient in implementing reforms that can attract more uh, direct foreign direct investment into key industries across uh, uh, boost trade and, of course, development across uh, the Nigerian, all Nigerian sector, all spaces across the sector. Uh, to give us more insights into this, I'm being joined, well, virtually again, by the Chief Executive Officer of Kauri Assets Management Limited, Mr. John Chuku. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chuku, it's good to have you uh, on the program. Thank you, Tuli, for having me. Yes, let's start quickly with, uh, I was looking at the funeral yesterday in the, in the UK, and what came to my mind as a business person, 
is the business relations between Nigeria and UK. What more should we be expecting? Where are we and where should we be or where can we be? Uh, I think you could help us understand that. Okay, um, the way I would look at it is this. Uh, United Kingdom is the largest uh, uh, source of capital importation into the country. Mm. That means uh, foreign direct investors, foreign portfolio investors coming into the country. The, the, the United Kingdom is the country of origination of most of the foreign uh, capital importation in the country. So uh, beyond that, the UK, uh, I mean, United Kingdom is also a major uh, export market for the country. And that market could actually be uh, grown because uh, United Kingdom hosts the largest number of Nigerians in diaspora. And those Nigerians in diaspora still have a demand for Nigerian goods. But beyond that, it's also um, one of the uh, most developed financial markets in the world. So it's a source of capital uh, distribution across the globe. Um, and then uh, it's one country that we have a historical and cultural affinity with. Uh, if you consider the fact that they were our colonial masters, and since they stayed their foot here, uh, we've had a very strong relationship with them in terms of social interaction, in terms of economic engagement, even in terms of military support. So um, it, it's one country that one would say the Nigerian nation has every uh, responsibility to continue to nurture the relationship we have with them in terms of bilateral relationship we have with them. Mm. But strengthening this relationship is where I am going. What policies should we be looking at uh, at this time to take advantage of all of this? We've seen what's happening between Russia and Ukraine and how Nigeria could benefit what maybe gas and some other uh, uh, spaces where we can do better. But how can we uh, make this relationship better? Okay, it's going to be from a lot of from engagement, and I uh, will point, uh, uh, try to see if I can talk on through through some of those uh, areas of engagement. One is the issue of making um, United Kingdom or, or Britain a recipient or a recipient country for some of our exports. Uh, our particular agricultural products exports to United Kingdom, uh, we can actually engage them in some level of I mean, it has a bilateral relationship with them so that they can allow the entry of a lot of agricultural products. With Britain exiting from the Europe, European Union, uh, it has created an opportunity for countries like Nigeria to fill some of the supply sources that Britain was enjoying, including agricultural products. And some of the stringent conditions that were imposed by Europe uh, against agricultural export from Africa, uh, Britain is likely going to lower those standards to allow for some form of reciprocity in terms of our export to that market. So we need to work on that so that we can expand the value of our export to Britain. Uh, beyond that, I had mentioned the issue that Britain hosts the largest number of Nigerians in diaspora, so you already have a market for Nigerian products. Uh, the other things we need to do is that, you mentioned the issue of gas. Britain may not so much of need of Nigerian gas because Britain has its own gas, but the reality is that we can work with them to attract foreign capital into the country so that we can build a trans saharan uh, pi uh, uh, pipeline that will take uh, gas from Nigeria through Morocco to Europe. Uh, because uh, Europe is hurting, given the war going on between U um, Ukraine and Russia in terms of gas supply. And Europe is very open to receiving gas from Nigeria and any other country that can supply them. Britain can provide that funding uh, because there's a lot of capital available in, in, in England. So those are some of the areas we can work to optimize the relation we have with them in terms of economic value to us as a country. Mm, good one there. Uh, implications for Nigeria uh, now because, okay, while I was doing my research, I saw that um, he, the king has visited Nigeria a number of times. And some say there are Africans even in the cabinet. Uh, a notable one is the Secretary of State for International Trade. Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking at how that will impact us positively one way or the other. Yes, um, King Chastre uh, has a long relationship with Nigeria. Um, and uh, like you said, Kemi, uh, Mrs. Kemi uh, is... Um, uh, grew up here. My father she grew up in Nesbidin to my uh, where I used to live. I knew her from her childhood, and um, she's uh, one of the secretary. Uh, sec she's the secretary of trade. So we can actually, like I said, we have a deep relationship with them. We have a cultural affinity with them. We have commercial relationship with them. We have economic engagement with Britain, 
And um, uh, we can, of course, you know that uh, the king is not the head of government. The prime minister is the head of government. So the king is more of a titular or ceremonial head of state. But that still brings a lot of influence. Uh, which is why I actually expected that Nigeria will be fully represented at the internment uh, of the or the burial of the king of the queen. I actually expected that president should have physically been there, given that the organ he went to attend uh, will start today, and all the uh, all the heads of states of the other countries were in England to attend the queen's burial, and after which they will now go to uh, to New York for organ. So I expected the president have been, should have been there. But they, in any case, the vice president was there. Uh, it, Britain is one country we should continue to nurture a relationship with. And uh, the king, uh, the new king of England, I mean, King Charles III, uh, will, has deep knowledge of Nigeria, deep knowledge of Nigerian politics, deep knowledge of, deep knowledge of Nigeria's social uh, st structure. And we should ensure that we will continue to expand and develop that, to, to, particularly focusing on economic uh, engagement. All right, uh, before, before, before we let go, uh, wrap up this segment, let's touch on the United States of America, which the president is also attending uh, uh, the U uh, UN, uh, that's the General Assembly, uh, at the moment, United Nations General Assembly, 77th one now. What are you expecting from all of those discussions? They're supposed to be focused on investment, of course, how to promote investment and how to strengthen ties one way or the other, also with the United States. Your reaction uh, to this? Well, the first thing, like I said, it, 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 from what I just said earlier, it is important and necessary that there are presidents, just like is, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, that we show presidents are such global gathering of uh, heads of states. Uh, it makes people know that we are there. But beyond that, I, I think for us to attract investment from uh, other countries, we must also make our investment climate attractive. So in, the president has a lot of work to do at home beyond what he has to do overseas, because you cannot really sell uh, what is not attractive. So we should look at in how in, in works and look at what are those things we need to do to make this uh, environment, our economic environment, very attractive for investors. That's when the president will have a, a bragging right to stand before any nation, uh, any national head of any nation head of state to say, look, come to my country and come and invest. So we need to do the heavy lifting here uh, while we do the public relations over there. Hmm. So uh, I want to talk about the ease of doing business initiative, which was focused on, I, I guess it should not be just internal, that's for uh, Nigerians. I think you should also be able to help attract some foreign investors to come into the country. What is your assessment of this so far? A lot of reports coming from them. Uh, I don't think we've really changed when it comes to the ratings of uh, the World Bank is of doing business initiative. How well are we doing and what is happening? If, if you stay back about four years ago, um, during the, uh, the tenure of the Minister of Trade, uh, okay, Nelema, uh, there was a lot of improvement. There was some level of progress. We introduced the visa on arrival, which was a major uh, improvement uh, in giving access to foreign investors who wanted to come to the country. Of course, we, we don't expect a lot of people to come here and uh, start uh, doing many jobs because the opponents are not here. Nigeria are looking for jobs. So anybody who wants to come to Nigeria, is not, it is, Nigeria is not yet a tourist uh, destination. They are coming to do business. And if they are coming to do business, it's good that you facilitate their ease, the ease of entry into the country. We did that. We did a few uh, things in, in terms of improving the time it takes to register business in the country, time it takes to pay taxes, uh, land registration titles, and all those things. And I need, think we need to... Um, go back to the basic and begin to look at those other areas we need to improve. Like I correctly pointed out, we've not seen material improvement in the past couple of years, but the opportunities are still there. Uh, the key thing for me is that if you want to attract investors, you need to uh, keep uh, do some uh, housekeeping, one of which was what I referred to when we did the uh, investment arrival. And that's thing we need to do is make our airports a bit more attractive, more receptive, more, more uh, appealing to people who are passing through that, because that's the first point of contact people uh, who are coming to your country. That's the first report card they will see of your country. We need to do that. I'm happy with what has happened uh, the um, Oshodi, airport Oshodi Express Road, which uh, was rebuilt by the last government in, this, in Lagos State. We need to now expand that. Ordinarily, Nigeria should be uh, an aviation hub in West Africa, if only we can fix the road that goes to Benin Republic. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, a lot of work needs to be do, done on the ease of doing business. Um, we have we have proof of concept that we can do a few things and do it, do them right. 
and that the impact of that could be quite significant. Hmm. Well, it's a good way to live it. It's always an interesting conversation with Sir John C. Chuku, and we don't always want to let go. But this is what time can take. I, I have the housekeeping rules, our airports, and all of that. I'm taking notes, and we'll keep on speaking around all of this. At least we'll get better and attract some more investments into our dear country. Thank you so much, Chief Executive Officer, Kauri Assets Management Limited, for always being there for us. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. All right, there. Well, it's time to talk markets. And if you're on is in the studio, and Mr. Rotimi Fakayejo should be joining us via phone. Oh, well, the market is still down. Again, as for today, we have RT Brisco, we have FBNH, uh, we have a Link of Show, we have Regalings, we have M Benefit losers for today. We have Total, we have Len Africa, we have Honeywell Flower, we have Cortex, and we have Nigerian Police Force, Microfinance uh, Bank, and the losers. Uh, list today. Uh, yeah, let's get talking. Mr. Fakayejo, are you there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is your take with regards to the figures uh, from the exchange? And what are, what, what are fundamentals driving trade uh, at this time? Well, um, so there we, the market closed flat. And I would say positive flat because uh, yesterday, the Russia index closed at uh, 49,440 basis points, and today it closed 49,445 basis points. So it's positive but flat. Uh, at this time, um, there isn't uh, much sentiment driving the market, and uh, what just what I noticed is that uh, uh, today the value of trade is better. It's over two billion compared to yesterday, whereby it was less, and also on uh, Friday when it was equally less. And I believe strongly that um, investors are comfortable with the state of the market, except that there is no new fund coming in. The liquidity is not there to actually drive up uh, the uh, prices. And at the same time, uh, uh, investors are quite cautious in their transactions, but nobody is actually... I know I, there is not some sort of panic to uh, really in the market right now. So everything is calm, and uh, the investors are still very much uh, positive. So the, the fundamentals still stand right. The results we saw for um, Q2, uh, virtually all of them were really good, especially the blue chip stocks. And that also is very much what is actually giving hope and uh, uh, better uh, returns in the future for investors. Expectation of better returns. Mr. Fakaido, thank you so much and do enjoy the rest of your day. You're welcome. If you're, I know you want to take it up from where Mr. Fakari just yes. Are you optimistic? <laughs> uh, what, 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 are, what are your thoughts? What's running through your mind at the moment? Well, I think that uh, the sentiments in the market is largely being uh, cautious. That's the, the way it, it is. And if you stay cautious, you are not likely to bond your fingers. As he said, we do not have any a kind of uh, uh, attraction you know, in any parts of the market that is to drive heavy funds into any sector. We've seen uh, greater improvements today in the volume that uh, we traded. Yesterday was just about 65 million units of shares. Today, 117 million, and uh, value above 2 billion. So there is a, a slight uh, improvement, but still very, very low. And the uh, expectation is that we will still be seeing lower figures in the weeks ahead, even as we want to launch a you know, full campaign. You know. So from now until the end of the year, I, I, I think that our uh, market will just be up, down, up and down, keeping its uh, characteristics. But then the important thing is that as we see the market this way, uh, performing on the average level, those who have um, the mind to accumulate wealth for future, it is a very good opportunity because these uh, securities are coming with very cheap prices. And so many of them, if they have the money, they can accumulate. But all of this uh, talking about uh, high time, huge volume as we used to do, uh, it, it's not going to be come for a very long time because investors generally want to reduce risk 
that they take in the market for obvious reasons, because you do not know when economic uh, situation will really improve. Of course. Yes. When will the inflation rates begin to yes. come down? When will the exchange rates, the two that we have, begin to you know, narrow down? And many other things. So these are the things shaping and frightening investors. Mm. Indeed. Mm. It's scary, but uh, we have to just leave it that way and we keep a tab <laughs> exactly. on, uh, you know, giving our view as information yes. regards trading yeah. across the market. We, we do our job and believing that uh, tomorrow will be better. Thank you so much, <laughs> Evian Gekko, as usual. Mm. Thank you, Tim. All right. The Wellness Move Asian shares edged up in the early trade today following a rebound in the final hour of New York trading as investors turn their attention to an expected hefty Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes this week to tackle inflation. MSCI's broadest index of Asian Pacific shares outside Japan was up 0.7%, while U.S. stock features the S&P 500 e minus rose 0.1%, Japan's nickel advanced 0.38%, and Australian shares climbed 1.1%, China's blue chips. CSI index was 0.54% higher in early trade, while Hong Kong Hang Seng index opened up 0.92%. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq Composite rebounded after logging uh, their worst weekly percentage drop since June as markets were fully priced for a rise in interest rates for at least 75 basis points as at the end of Fed's September 2020 to 21st policy meeting. The Swiss government has announced a significant cut in its economic growth forecast, citing growing risk from the tense energy situation and sharp price increases. According to the country's Secretariat for Economic Affairs, in 2023, the economy is expected to expand by 1.1%, down from the previous expectations of 1.9% increase. Switzerland, which is the least dependent on Russian gas, has seen significantly lower inflation than the neighboring eurozone, with its forecast, uh, based, but its forecasts are based on the assumption that there will be no shortages if there is a reduction in gas or electricity. Earlier this month, three of Germany's leading economic institutes lowered their forecast for Europe's largest economy next year, predicting higher energy prices caused by Ukraine war which will take, uh, will take their toll. PepsiCo Incorporated said it has stopped the production of Pepsi, 7-Up, and Mountain Dew in Russia, nearly six months after the U.S. company said it would suspend sales and production after Moscow's sales and production uh, after sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine. Pepsi's announcement came after dozens of supermarkets, retailers, and gyms in Moscow and beyond found cans and bottles of Pepsi printed with July and August production dates from factories within Russia. The company also noted that the continued availability of the product highlights the complexity of withdrawing from one of the world's largest countries. Meanwhile, Atlanta-based rival Coca-Cola Co. Uh, production in Russia also continued after it said in March it will suspend operations. Oil prices on international market ticked up today as OPEC and its allies kept, uh, keep producing less than their quotas. But we're headed for a fourth monthly decline ahead of fourth monthly decline ahead of an expected further U.S. interest rate hike, which may curb economic growth and fuel demand. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude remains in the red zone, recording a price decline of 0.35%, selling at $85.43 per barrel. Brent crude sells at $92.06 per barrel, with an upward price margin of 0.07%. Bonnie Light offers $93.40 per barrel, with an uptick of 1.14% for the OPEC basket. Crude oil dealer slips selling $95.70 per barrel, with a downward price margin of 1.64%. That's Business Nigeria for, day, th for today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'll see you tomorrow, same time. Stay with TVC News for the rest of our programming. <music>